On today's Apple Daily, Apple's VR AR headset coming in 2022 and the Apple Car in 2025, plus Touch ID on Apple Watch and Apple TV remotes, and will the iMac Pro get dual M1 Max processors? And this episode is sponsored by Private Internet Access. Use my code privateinternetaccess.com forward slash iCaveDave for four free months with your subscription. More details later. I'm I Cave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like the video, subscribe to the channel and ring me bell. So first up, the mixed reality headset which I think might be called Apple Vision, though I'd love to see it be called EyeSight, but you know, that might be something that would be better for the glasses. According to Gurmi, it will be landing with us in quarter four of next year, that is October to December. Stuff doesn't generally get announced in December, AirPods Max, you know, out of that. But probably the first half of November would be the latest I would expect to see it. This is not Apple Glass we're talking about. This is the full eye covering VR style headset. And it seems that Apple is going to be using 4K micro LED. And it seems that Apple is going to be using dual micro OLED 4K panels from Sony, one for each eye, with an M1 equivalent processor with a second processor on board in order to deal with power management and the other gubbins. So maybe like the A13 we were hearing about for the displays. There are conflicting reports as to whether this will be a standalone device uh, or need a Mac or an iPhone to set it up. But assuming the M1 level of processing on board, it doesn't seem like they would need to offload anything. So standalone kind of makes sense. Now, the report saying that it would need to be paired with another device did come via the information who have a 90% plus track record over on Apple Track. They should normally be believed. However, this came out quite a long time ago, so it's feasible that things have simply changed since then and they weren't in accurate at the time. It will be interesting to see what Apple's approach to VR and AR in a headset is. Right now there aren't really any other companies on the planet that make a technology mainstream in the way that Apple does. Even 5G was still fairly niche until it came to the iPhone 12, prompting faster rollouts from carriers. And Len Adams actually in iCave Answers asked, what do you think the screen interface on the Apple mixed reality headset will be like? And honestly it's really hard to tell. There are similarities across all of Apple's product lines with even the Mac getting the launchpad grid of apps eventually. But how will the headset transition from its like home page if it has one uh, or the desktop layout into the apps will be quite interesting. Will it be something that you only wear when you're actively using it like sitting down at your Mac or will it be something more like passively wearing an Apple Watch and interacting with the world without worrying about it. Seems more likely that the later Apple Glass would be more in that role of the passive. With Apple Vision, and yes I'm sticking with that name, being closer to the active interaction of a Mac. Perhaps you'll have like a 360 degree workspace so you just turn around to look at what you want to interact with. It's really difficult to know uh, until we see it, and it could be as soon as WWDC of 2022 when we do see it, with a full-scale rollout being in the fourth quarter, similar to how Apple did the Apple Silicon rollout. Developers get a development kit soon after the conference, just like the A12Z equipped Mac Mini DTKs, followed by the consumer devices shipping in time for the holidays. I'd expect Apple to have a good deal of frameworks in place to make development quite quick for those wanting to get on board from the start. And it will inherit a lot from what already happens with Apple's AR on the phone and the iPad. And moving on to Apple Car. Apple Car looks set to be around four years away from announcement and it's quite possible that the announcement will be along with pre-orders, not sales. Very much like when Tesla announces most of their cars a year or two ahead of shipments. Or, you know, five if you're talking about the Roadster. This would allow Apple to make their reveal ahead of both mass production and on-the-road testing. It appears that Apple has bought an existing proving ground test track, though public road testing will be lengthy and vital ahead of the launch of their pure self-driving vehicles. With Kevin Lynch at the wheel-free helm, it looks like the project is firing on all electric motors. But there's still a long way to go before we see any real hardware. I just hope it doesn't become another standalone Apple TV set that the whole community was so excited about a few years ago. And into iCave Answers. I didn't really want to do this, but I'm going to have to. We're going to change the way that iCave Answers works very slightly, and purely in that some questions that get asked, I'm just going to have to answer in the comments. We're getting so many now that the sheer volume of them is just going to make the shows way too long unless we turn it into a standalone, which is still a possible option. Let me know if you'd prefer that down in the comments section. But... Uh, for right now, what we're going to do is I'm going to pick out the questions that we've got interesting stuff to say about, and the rest of it, you'll get an answer in the comment section. I'm still committed to answering every comment, which, 
I think until now I've still done. Uh, there are certainly some that get disappeared by YouTube and there's not a lot I can do about that. But every comment that I see, I will reply to. But yes, some of the comments, some of the questions will just get an answer in the comments. I will give you the information, but it's not always going to be a part of the show. Hope that makes sense. Let me know what you think. First up, Len Adams asks, do you think the future of Apple TV is uncertain? And you also asked about Touch ID on an Apple TV remote, but I thought I'd just uh, combine these two into a single question. Um, no, Apple TV is going to be around for a long time. It will probably change uh, in certain ways. It may well be that it combines with HomePod in certain ways, so it could have its own speakers built in. But the Apple TV itself is a core part of what Apple offers. Uh, the Apple TV Plus service is based on the fact that they have their TV option, the fact that you can use the displays that are attached to an Apple TV as an extension of your Mac as well is very useful, or you can use it as a Mac display. All of these things are really helpful, and it's kind of one of those things that slots into the ecosystem, and although it's not particularly exciting, it does a job, and it does a job pretty well. It's just still too expensive. In terms of the Touch ID on an Apple TV remote, uh, you mentioned for buying apps. Nobody bothers with that, really, on Apple TV. Although there is an app store, nobody really does it. I mean, I can understand it for making a payment if you want to buy a movie or something, but I think having the option of either typing it your password or typing your password with your voice or authorizing it on another uh, Apple device, like your watch or your iPhone, seems like that would be absolutely enough for convenience. I do think we're going to see Apple TVs coming out without physical remotes uh, in the near future where your iPhone becomes the remote for it. I can't imagine there are more than about three people in the world that have bought an Apple TV that aren't in the Apple ecosystem already with iPhones or iPads or Macs or Apple Watches. And on the same topic, uh, Len Adams also asks, how do you feel about the Touch ID on an Apple Watch in a patent? I would honestly say I don't think it's needed right now. I think adding a Touch ID sensor to an Apple Watch is just added expense and doesn't really add anything particularly feature-wise. Uh, right now, your Apple Watch knows when it's on your wrist. You, it knows that you are you because you put in your passcode when you put it on or you unlock it using your phone when it's on. So you can use your biometrics to do it that way. The only reason I think they might add it is if they wanted to make it a fully standalone device uh, so that you can have an Apple Watch and not own an iPhone. Uh, at the moment, you can do that from a family point of view, but you still have to have someone in the family to set it up with a phone. If they were to add a, a Touch ID sensor, that would make sense for unlocking but obviously Apple reverts to the passcode when it doesn't know that it's 100% you that's doing stuff. Uh, that's their kind of security backup, which is what they currently use at the minute. So Apple obviously considers the passcode to be the most secure option. If they added Touch ID, it would be great to be able to put it on Touch ID and away you go. But is it really saving that much time? You don't have to unlock it every single time anyway because it's attached to your wrist and Apple knows that. And next, Marcin Kowalczyk asks, IK answers, just how likely is an M1X? Yes, I've activated max evasion mode in the Pro iMac variant. Or is it just a fallacy and we're getting just a single high power die like in the laptops in the iMac? At the moment, it looks fairly realistic that we could be getting a dual die uh, iMac. So basically two M1 Max processors inside the iMac. Um, that actually looks fairly reasonable uh, from what's being said by various different outlets, including Mark Gurman, I believe. So I certainly wouldn't rule it out. I think quad in the Mac Pro desktop and dual in a, a Pro iMac, if they're going to bring back the iMac Pro name, makes a lot of sense. I think a single one in a 24 and a 27 inch iMac also makes sense uh, with the Macs and Pro chips. I think that's going to happen. And I think we might also be able to get the bigger iMac dis uh, size, the bigger 27 inch with the M1 as well, probably for a couple of hundred dollars more than the 24 inch if they do the same as they did with the laptops. And now a word from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. It's a simple to use VPN that works with your Mac, iPhone, iPad, and even those PC things and Android phones, routing all of your traffic through a secure tunnel to hide your IP address and keep what you're doing private. And let's be honest, if you're watching this video, you're probably using the devices you are because you value your privacy. Private Internet Access hides your network data from everyone, from your internet service provider or network administrator to government sensors. And it's the most customizable on the market, letting you set custom rules for different websites and offering no bandwidth restrictions or speed throttling so you can stream, upload and download to your heart's content. 
privately. And my favorite part is that it's 100% open source, so if you're one of those clever people who knows what you're actually looking at, it's easy to verify that everything is above board from the open GitHub repositories. No user data is stored and PIA's no log policy has been proven in court multiple times. So get your three year subscription with four extra months absolutely free for only $1.98 a month. That's 83% off only by visiting privateinternetaccess.com forward slash iCaveDave as this offer is exclusive for you guys and it's risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee and 24 seven customer support. So why wait? Thank you so much for watching today, guys. Don't forget, leave your questions for IK Answers down in the comment section, and I will pick the best ones for the show. Otherwise, you will get an answer in the comments. I won't ignore your questions just because they don't make it into the show. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.